Let's talk very briefly about some of your second tier drugs. I asked Tom to just briefly discuss BRAF. BRAF occurs in a couple of percent? It's about one to three percent of lung cancer yeah. patients, and of those, only about half have the V600E, which is a uh, notable uh, mutation. And, and, in that's, and, and that's quoted. It's, it's a little bit of a pet peeve because young Dr. Villarubes wrote up the Lung Cancer Mutation Consortium data in in the LCMC in all stage four patients, it was 80% had V600E, so. But did, did all the sites test for the non-V600E? I think, I think that enriched for the. Uh, that I don't know. I think that, that I enriches for the okay. V600E's right. yeah. a little yeah. bit. Yeah, okay. So I'll concede a high water mark of 80%. So, so 50 to 80% of the 1 or 3% okay. with right, BRAF yeah. have a V600E. Yeah. Small numbers. Uh, small yeah. numbers, importantly. But I think uh, this is more common in smoking patients, which is I think we focus a lot on the non-smokers and the mutations common non-smokers. So this is something that uh, I think is really important to test for. We know with uh, dibrafenib alone that uh, there's been about a 30% response rate observed in these patients. And with the combina combination of dibrafenib and trametinib, uh, the response rate goes up to 60% and it sort of mirrors the activity in melanoma. And so I think that this is um, an area that we need to focus on. A uh, small population, but a very important population. Yeah, no, yeah. It's, it's, it is, I mean, uh, recently having, I think I treated the last patient on the combination uh, study before it closed. And young lady, very symptomatic, and within three days she was, boom, a brand new. And she's, you know, obviously enjoying a very nice, nice response. Um, uh, another second tier, uh, RET alterations. Uh, Greg, you've done some work at uh, yeah. Sloan with this. RET rearrangements, you know, so like ALK and ROS, this is a gene rearrangement. It's not a mutation. It's a little harder to detect. It has to be with a fish assay or a next generation sequencing. But uh, RET rearrangements are probably about 1 or 2% of patients with lung adenocarcinoma. Uh, we need to find a good RET inhibitor to, to really exploit this uh, identification. But today we have a, a dirty drug, cabozantinib, which has significant red inhibitory properties. And in a prospective trial from our institution, we have seen response rates on the order of what you see for dibrafenib and BRAF mutant lung cancer, about 30%. Um, it's not uh, a home run because it's a response rate in the 30% range, but I think if we find a better red inhibitor, uh, it's going to move its way into the first line. But either way, it's still way better than docetaxel and even I'll, this may be heresy, better than uh, nivolumab right. in, in the second line right. setting for yeah. patients with red positive disease. Yeah, yeah. and then um, Dr. Weiss, the other one is, that's a bit more complicated because there are several different forms of MET alterations, but comment on the MET story. Right, so what you get with MET depends a lot on how you define it. Um, I think we're all familiar with the data that when it was defined by IHC for simple overexpression, that was sort of a graveyard for, for MET trials. Uh, but there are new ways that MET, what it means to have MET is being looked at. We've seen a small number of patients, I think uh, all of six, uh, presented with high-level MET amplification, where it looks like if you're looking at the high levels of uh, MET to CEP7, looking at ratios of five, or, five to six or more, that that's probably a unique driver. 80% response rate. Five out of six. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was oral at ASCO. It must be. Yeah. It must be. I know. But you I know, know. Th that's what's going to happen as you get to these rarer and rarer changes. You're going to have fewer and fewer patients. Um, so it is kind of funny, but it also is what we're going to see in these rares. And in case that wasn't rare enough, uh, moving on to MET deletion 14, uh, or these exon skipping mutations. I think people are still arguing a little bit about exactly what to call them. But more to the point, again, very small patient numbers in terms of the published or formally presented literature. You're talking about a handful of case studies. But you're talking, again, about high rates of efficacy and including in a population where typically we were not used to seeing particularly good efficacy, which is to say the sarcomatoid uh, non-small cell uh, patients. Yeah. And so I would say, you know, to simplify it, it's a stay tuned um, marker looking very promising. Um, although I would note that looking at some of these rare changes um, with small numbers of patient data, looking at HER2, at RET, at the various MET perturbations that you've brought up, they are specifically mentioned in NCCN now um, as things that you should test for and that you should consider actioning with a Category 2B recommendation. And that um, choice to recommend will influence real-world practice and reimbursement decisions. Yeah, because, because you know, once you start diagnosing these oncogenic drivers, you as a physician are going to become addicted to the diagnosing the oncogenic drivers because <laughs> these drugs can work, and they make a huge difference yeah. in the life yeah. of a patient. So.
I'll just add to the MedEx on 14 story that this represents a uh, about 4% of people with lung adenocarcinoma. This right. is this is much more common, much closer to the ALK story than the other rare events. I also add that when I read the sarcomoid, the pulmonary sarcomoid on the PATH report, I uh, double check to make sure that there's been some met. Yeah. Uh, that's a cue to double check things.